overlapping the racial terrorism we've just discussed were the advent of so-called Jim Crow laws, the apogee of the racial caste system imposed by white legislatures and city governments in the United States. In referring to places and times when Jim Crow laws existed, we use the phrase de jure segregation, that is segregation by law, but don't be fooled. Places that did not legislate Jim Crow used informal and private means as well as bureaucratic regulations to enforce racial segregation. We call this de facto segregation. Any place the law did not actively protect civil rights, those civil rights were systematically stripped from minorities. We'll look at the law and at one example of private and bureaucratic discrimination. Even during Reconstruction, some southern states segregated schools by race through local constitutions, state general statutes, and so-called local laws that required state approval, like those that created local school districts and that reiterated state segregation within the text of those local laws. We see this in the compilation of Alabama statutes that I've created and have inserted into your readings. The legislature created separate school districts that specified the number of schools and that they were to be segregated and how their funding operated. Until after our era, schools in our example, Alabama, were funded by four revenue streams, so-called 16th section funds, that is since the land ordinance of 1785, the federal government supplied money to the states for schools based upon the sale of the 16th section of 36 section townships surveyed across the face of the United States. Another of these uh, revenue streams is state appropriations, another is donations directly to schools, and another is local taxes. Now, poll taxes existed since emancipation and the only punishment for non-payment was the loss of the right to vote. People with little access to wealth or cash usually simply bypass paying their poll taxes. They didn't get to vote, but state and local laws distributed poll tax revenue according to how much each race paid in Alabama. Because blacks paid less than whites and there were also fewer blacks to pay than there were whites to pay, black schools received less funding. A more equitable mechanism, which we use now, is to tax property and distribute those funds per pupil in the district. In his book, Black Education in Alabama, 1865 to 1901, Robert Scherer reports on pay differentials between white and black teachers. In 1890, that differential was 4.5%. In raw numbers, white teachers received $22.04 per month to black teachers, $21.05, or a 95 cent difference. By 1909, that differential had climbed to over 50%. White teachers received $50.92 per month. Black teachers received $25.23 per month, a difference of $25.26. Additionally, Less money went to fund black teacher education than white, and opportunities for professional development were different. Some so-called local laws establishing county school districts in Alabama mandated summer teaching institutes for white teachers, but not for black teachers. High schools, even when they existed, were for white students. It's only after our period that counties were required to create schools above the elementary grades for black students. In Alabama, these often went by the title of training institutes. During the Jim Crow era, public accommodations were segregated by race. This included hotels, parks, theaters, eating establishments, public transportation, arenas, hospitals, and all other places where people could gather on anything approaching a regular basis. For our discussion of how the law deliberately segregated such accommodations, we'll look at the history of rail segregation laws. Remember, before there were laws, there was custom, but custom is not as rigidly enforced as law. 
And on things like rail cars, the conductor was in charge and answered to the company. So he, and I know of no conductor who is not a male, might choose to overlook any violation of a social norm or might make arrangements other than fully segregating rail cars. But in 1881, Tennessee passed the first segregated car law. It mandated that trains in Tennessee divide first class and second class rail cars by race and was reasonably mild, bordering on paternalistics. That is, the whites protected what they saw as the interests of black passengers from the railroads. In 1887, Florida passed a law that segregated first class cars, but also protected respectable black passengers from insult or annoyance. Two years later, Texas codified the common law practice that allowed but did not require segregation. But it also passed a fine for anyone who sat in the wrong section or the wrong car if a railroad did indeed segregate. The important change occurred in 1890 with, with Louisiana passing its separate car act that mandated that all trains have equal but separate, quote unquote, cars for passengers by race that no one was to occupy a car assigned to the other race and that conductors were empowered and responsible for assigning passengers to each car and for enforcing the law. The law imposed a fine of $25 or 20 days in jail for violators. Also, if a railroad company official or a conductor failed to enforce the law, they were guilty of a misdemeanor. This was the law that Homer Plessy deliberately violated to get a challenge to it into the courts. He lost that case, Plessy versus Ferguson, in 1896. Once Louisiana opened the door, Tennessee, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Kentucky, and Texas passed similar laws requiring segregation in cars and forcing rail officials to comply. After the Supreme Court handed down the Plessy decision that allowed separate but equal segregation and gave police powers to train conductors, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia passed their own separate car laws. These lasted into the 1960s. Although the 15th Amendment prohibited states from disfranchising voters because of race, there are many other ways to do so by leveraging characteristics of blacks and poor whites, such as illiteracy, unstable residences, poverty, and being subjected to the criminal justice system. Until Mississippi hit on what became a magic combination of mechanisms in its 1890 constitution, other states had tried multiple ways to restrict the ballot to worthy voters, or at least to keep some local bosses from dominating politics by fraudulently buying votes, as so often happened in the Alabama Black Belt. South Carolina opened its eight-box system, quote-unquote gambit, designed to prevent votes of the illiterate from counting. Established in 1882, this eight-box system used one voting box per state office per voting station. Remember, the ballot then was not like your ballot now. Voters used tokens or paper slips to vote. In the eight-box system, voting sites officials moved boxes around and prohibited literate voters from assisting illiterate ones from reading the labels. And if a slip for governor, for example, found its way into the Secretary of State box, it simply wasn't counted. In 1889, Tennessee legislated a series of restrictions, including registration requirements and separate ballot boxes for state and federal elections, with all kinds of shenanigans being played with the state boxes. This state made it illegal to assist anyone who is illiterate in completing a ballot, unless that illiterate person had voted in 1857 or before, which meant they were white. And the state implemented poll taxes to vote. In its 1890 constitution, Mississippi pioneered voter suppression with a combination of mechanisms that other states adopted, principally the poll tax, the literacy understanding test, and the grandfather clause. To vote, a man had to pay $1.50 per year, and if he missed a year, he had to make it up. Thus, an expensive and cumulative poll tax prevented poor men from voting. In 
Literacy tests prevented those without education from voting, but it combined with understanding tests that poll officials had arbitrary control over. And so it stopped anyone the official didn't want to vote from doing so. The Mississippi kicker, however, was the grandfather clause. The literacy and understanding test did not apply to anyone whose ancestors were legally entitled to vote prior to 1859. Again, as in Tennessee's grandfather clause, this meant white people. And let me re-explain that. In Tennessee, if you could vote in 1857 or before, then you could vote after 1889. But in Mississippi, if you or your grandparents could vote, any ancestor could vote prior to 1859, you were allowed to vote after 1890. With the Supreme Court decision in Williams versus Mississippi in 1898, we discussed this earlier, the Williams decision allowed administrative discrimination if the text of the law appeared race neutral, then Mississippi declared political parties to be private clubs so the 15th Amendment did not apply to them. Immediately, the Democratic Party closed its ranks against black membership, so their nominating processes guaranteed all white slates that were sure to win election. When Mississippi adopted the primary election system introduced by South Carolina in 1898, its 1902 law allowed only white people to vote in what amounted to the true election. In Alabama's 1901 constitution, Poll taxes were enshrined, as were literacy tests, lengthy residency requirements, and that constitution added something new, permanent disfranchisement for certain criminal convictions that usually happen to black men. All other former Confederate states and Oklahoma instituted through law or constitutional change versions of these voter suppression laws. The Southern Solons, made no secret of their aim to purify the ballot from the baleful influence of unqualified voters. In Alabama, the progressives who wrote the 1901 Constitution went so far as to announce that they were trying to reduce the power of black belt planters who simply bought black votes to keep power from counties with fewer African American residents. Oddly, the election for the new Alabama Constitution saw black voters agree overwhelmingly with their own disfranchisement. Most analysts suspect that there was vote counting fraud. As a coda to this sad tale, the Supreme Court found the grandfather clause unconstitutional in 1915 and found the all white primary unconstitutional in 1944. The idea of personal freedom being linked to bodily autonomy is endemic in US legal and political history. The Declaration of Independence tells us that we have the natural right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the 14th Amendment tells us that we cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. We understand liberty to include the right to do with ourselves as we see fit and to have the same rights to do so as all other people. Just as enslavement and slave codes subjected black bodies to control of private individuals, some Jim Crow laws subjected black bodies to the will of the state through legislation, which is not what the 14th Amendment meant by due process of law. Let's look at some examples of how Jim Crow laws controlled black and sometimes even white bodies. The first and most obvious example is anti-miscegenation laws that prohibit interracial marriage. To make these laws work, legislatures had to define race. The Code of Alabama, which is the example that I've been using throughout, of 1876 did not define a white person, but did define a person of color as having, quote, descended from Negro ancestors to the third generation inclusive, though one ancestor of each generation may have been a white person, unquote. In 1897, Alabama criminalized interracial coupling thus, if a white person and a, quote, Negro to the third generation intermarry or live in adultery or fornication, unquote, then they are subject to a prison sentence of two to seven years. That same year's code made giving a marriage license to a mixed race couple punishable by a fine of up to $1,000 and imprisonment of up to six months at hard labor. In 
the Alabama Constitution of 1901 made the injunction permanent. Section 102 reads simply, quote, the legislature shall never pass any law to authorize or legalize any marriage between any white person and a Negro or descendant of a Negro, unquote. Other states created similar statutes and constitutional sections. Only in the case of Loving versus Virginia in 1967 did the Supreme Court rule such laws unconstitutional and Alabama failed to remove the offensive Section 102 until the year 2000. Vagrancy laws were used to control black bodies in town. Along with the usual class of vagrants, that is hobos, prostitutes, and petty criminals, Jim Crow vagrancy laws acted against agricultural laborers who moved between farm work and city labor. Employment then was not like what we experience today. Throughout this era, it was often akin to what we now call day labor, with the so-called shape-up determining who did and didn't work any particular day in many occupations. Absenteeism was also very high. Employers complained that they had to hire twice as many workers as they needed to make sure their crews were filled because so many workers labored only as many days as they needed to make the money they wanted, and then they'd lay out the rest of the work week. In this environment, able-bodied men, often black, had little to do but loiter between jobs or while they waited for work. They were subject to arrest, confinement for up to 60 days, and being leased out or put to work on chain gangs. Lean laws, crop liens and furnishing liens in particular, slowed sharecroppers' ability to move. As time went on, such laws became stiffer preventing sharecroppers from moving between jobs until their debts to their current landlords or their current merchants were paid in full. Moving annually was common as landlords poached croppers or croppers sought better deals. Some landlords and merchants, enough to taint the entire class of owners, exploited their croppers by not allowing croppers to see their debts and by overcharging and underpaying. Even when croppers knew they were being abused, there was no recourse by law, and they could be imprisoned for fleeing even unjust debts. Some laws restricted movement, others priced people out of businesses. Labor contractors were one such case. Labor contractors were often the agents of landlords who poached sharecroppers from other landlords. This is called enticing workers away from their contracts. This activity increased when city industries and northern industries sought laborers. Almost as frequently as professional labor contractors, local guys might make a few bucks by bringing their friends to a new work site. In Alabama, labor contract laws required anyone doing this kind of labor agent work, even informally, to pay an exorbitant licensing fee to every county they operated in as well as to the state. That fee rose to $500 per year for each jurisdiction in 1903, with punishments for operating without a license set at a fine of up to $5,000 and imprisonment of up to four months at hard labor. To make sure no one could operate as a labor contractor or agent without fear of imprisonment, other laws made it a crime to entice workers or to, for workers to leave contracts before their expiration, quote, without written consent, unquote, of the original employer. These laws applied to the person leaving their employment, too. The last kind of Jim Crow law I'll speak about are those that segregated neighborhoods and cities. Customarily, self-segregation had existed in many cities, but as cities grew and as they became more crowded and as black middle-class folks arose, the sharp boundaries between racial neighborhoods became very hazy. Poor whites moving into black neighborhoods was not as shocking to most city governments as the occasional black person who moved into a formerly all-white neighborhood. In 1910, in part because of the number of black people who grew prosperous during the early days of the Great Migration, Baltimore, Maryland promulgated an ordinance that set strict racialized boundaries around a few neighborhoods. Other southern cities followed suit. Dallas, 
Louisville, Norfolk, Richmond, and Roanoke, and St. Louis. But soon someone sued because these laws were obviously based on race. Race was embedded in the text of the laws themselves. That case that came to the Supreme Court called Buchanan v. Worley complained that the Louisville Ordinance was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court decided in 1917 that it was indeed unconstitutional and therefore void, but not because it mentioned race, a violation of the 14th Amendment but because it interfered with the disposition of private property, also a violation of the 14th Amendment. Cities abandoned their ordinances for fear of being successfully sued, but two other mechanisms replaced ordinances. Restrictive residential covenants, that is contracts when buying property that required the owner to not sell to black people, and later municipal zoning ordinances that set requirements for residential property that caused it to be too expensive for poor white or most black buyers. <laughs>